Now, we've already had one uh, good example of mutualism in one of my talks. Does anybody have any idea what that was? Yes. The Brazil nut tree. You get the gold star this morning, okay? Uh, yes, what do you need to get a Brazil nut? You gotta have a tree. You have to have the Brazil nut long tongue bee, because it's the only insect that pollinates the Brazil nut flower. You've gotta have that particular species of orchid, because the male bee has to go to the orchid, get the scent of that orchid, so that Mrs. B will invite him in so they can have baby bees. And then you have to have something like the agouti, the little rodent thing that likes to chew into the hard uh, casting around the actual uh, nuts. And uh, you've got to have all those things. It's a, it's, um, it's a mutualistic, uh, it, by the way, that one's called obligatory mutualism. In other words, they're mutually dependent upon each other to, to stay alive. They all have to be there at the same time. Evolution has no answer whatsoever for that kind of thing, okay? That's one of my favorites. By the way, I'll t I'll, let me share another one while I'm thinking about it. Ah, we gotta get to this. Well, I'm gonna do this. The Ophry Ophrys Orchid Group, O-P-H-R-E-Y-S. One of the orchids is called the Stylidium Orchid. Now, how many of you know about the Stylidium Orchid? Nobody. Well, then I can just tell you anything, right? <laughs> uh, no, the style, these are this amazing what God has done. And you go a whole lifetime. You're not allowed to know about these things because we live in Satan's world system. It's based on deception. It's based on lies, okay? So if there's something that could not possibly evolve, you'll never hear about it. You can get a PhD and you'll never hear about it. Because God did these things, like Romans 1 says, so we'll give him thanks and give him glory. So you look at a stylidium orchid, and all you can say is, whoa, Lord Jesus, that is wonderful. Look at that. All right, you got the orchid, and this particular orchid mimics a particular species of wasp, of female wasp. So the orchid looks like the female wasp of a particular species of wasp, okay? The aroma that the orchid puts out, okay, you smell a flower, mmm, smells good. The aroma that that orchid puts out is the exact same aroma that the female wasp puts out when she's mature and looking for Mr. Wasp, okay? So the flower looks like Mrs. Wasp, smells like Mrs. Wasp, and here comes Mr. Wasp, and he's looking for Mrs. Wasp, okay? So he's coming along here, going, ooh, I smell Mrs. Wasp, oh, oh, there she is. He goes down and lands on the orchid that's fooled him. Now, when he lands on the orchid, the orchid is configured in such a way that when that particular wasp lands on it, it goes pop. And the orchid, it's like, a, like on a hinge action spring-loaded joint, goes pop and pops him down into the flower in such a way that his head bangs into the pollen sacs. And two pollen sacs attach to his head. Yeah, they could attach to mine. And uh, so he comes out of there. Oh, I think I'm going to have to find another Mrs. Wasp. So he goes flying. Oh, there she is. Mm, pop. There he goes again. Now here's the interesting thing. For two weeks, the male wasp is going from flower pop to flower pop to flower pop, looking for the love of his wife. She isn't there because the female wasp matures two weeks after the male wasp matures. It's the same two weeks that the Ophrys orchid is mature and ready to pollinate. Now think about this. How's that going to evolve, you see? No way. You could have billions of years. No way. Okay. So, two weeks later, now the female wasp is ready for Mr. Wasp. And so he's flying along here. Hmm, there's Mrs. Wasp. I mean, th yeah, there she is. Well, 
Once the female wasp is there, he will never again go back to the orchid. That's the only way that particular orchid pollinates itself. So there's a two week window once a year when the male wasp is ready for the female. The female is not there yet. The orchid is ready to pollinate, mature and ready to pollinate. How would that evolve? You see, there's no way. I've shared that at universities. Okay, you guys tell me how would that evolve? Silence, okay, because there isn't any way. God had to make all those things together so they all work together at the same time. They're mutualistic, dependent upon each other. And there's millions of things like that out there. And I'm still learning. People call me up, hey, have you ever heard of this? No, what is it? And then we learn about some more ones, okay? By the way, there are like somewhere between 600 and 900 different uh, species of figs in the rainforest, okay, in the Amazon rainforest. There are some animals that only eat figs. Okay, now we got a problem. Because if those figs would all be pollinated roughly as soon as they start blooming or something, so the same thing could pollinate any of them, then they're all going to be harvested at the same time. Like the wheat crop comes in, okay, harvest time, let's go get it. Well, these animals need to eat all year long, okay? So for the 600 to 900 different species of figs in the Amazon, every single fig has its own particular pollinator. A bee, a wasp, a fly, for one of them it's a mouse, okay? How can that be, okay? See, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth? How magnificent is your name? He wants us to study what he's made and then say, oh, Lord Jesus, this is wonderful. This is just wonderful. He wants us to worship him and him alone, by the way. All right, so probably some things will come to mind as we go, but let's just see what we have here. Uh, we're looking at these mutualistic symbiotic relationships and uh, evolution has no valid explanation for them. Uh, what was the thing that really was the key that turned my mind away from evolution to being a biblical young earth global flood creationist is when my dental students uh, came to me and asked me to study creation with them. They brought me the information about a bombardier beetle, okay? And they said, Dr. Martin, uh, you believe in evolution. Yes, I do. Well, would you show us how this little insect could evolve all of, all of its particular characteristics? I said, okay. Whoa, I, I spoke too soon. <laughs> I began to study the bombardier beetle. And that little bug, Mick, how many of you know about a bombardier beetle? Oh, good, almost every, where'd you find out about that? Oh, our DVDs, yeah. Uh, I have it in this book, too, all right? Um, I started studying that little bug. There's no way, it's gonna blow itself up every step of the way if evolution is true, okay? It's back on Incredible Creatures, number one. Uh, a Cornell University professor got the pictures of the thing actually shooting and things. By the way, if a bombardier beetle shoots a spider, the spider will only get shot once if it doesn't die. It'll never again try to eat a bombardier beetle. It has a memory, okay? A spider has a memory? Yep, yeah, they sure do, okay? All right, let's keep going here. Uh, definitions. There's all these different things. Uh, actually, symbiosis is, it can be different things, but it's usually two different organisms that either help each other, or one of them is helped and the other one isn't, or one of them is helped and the other one is dead, ultimately, like different parasites and things. So there's different ways of looking at it, but mutualism is, they're usually, they're both beneficial to each other, okay? They're mutually beneficial. And so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here on that. So here's a question. 
How do symbiotic or mutualistic relationships provide evidence against evolution and for special creation? Well, symbiotic mutualistic relationships between living organisms show that at least two, sometimes several organisms, have to exist at the same time or they can't survive. They just can't survive. Uh, there is one parasite, and I can't remember its name right now. It has seven, seven. My, my wife says, always hold up the right number of fingers. I said seven, and I held up four. What? Seven. How, how many is that? Here, seven. Okay. It has seven different hosts. Okay. It's going to go from host to host to host seven times in order uh, for it to survive. So it has to be places where all seven, oh, there I went again, seven hosts are available. How, how could that be? You see, God has all that worked out. All right, only God could have put all this in place. And he did it to prove I am God. I am the creator. This could not be here unless I did it. And I want you to know about it. And then give me glory and give me praise. Yeah, so the book, in between each chapter, I've got an animal, okay? And uh, so when I was writing this book, uh, this little boy, he was 12 years old. He was in my Sunday school class, in the girls' Sunday school class. They were, one of them was 12. And uh, he said, Dr. Martin, uh, may I write, uh, do some pictures for your book? I said, sure, EJ, go right ahead. And I'm thinking, I probably have to throw them out. Uh -huh. Unbelievable, a 12-year-old boy. He sketched these pictures in here. So people would read the book. This is before we had any DVDs. They'd read the book, and they would say, uh, boy, could you do some live pictures of some of those animals in the book? And uh, OK, so that was Incredible Creatures, number one. Would you do more some animals? More some, some more. See, my, my brain got scrambled a bit from that totaled of our car last Sunday night. So you, you, thank you for your prayers. Some of you have been praying very specifically for both Jenity and me, because we both had whiplash. Her head, she's got this bleed brain something, but she's doing great, and I'm doing good. I just don't like turning my head that way, but uh, we're doing good. That's your prayers. God's grace is sufficient. Why did I say that? I don't have any idea. All right, so the giraffe. He drew this giraffe's head. I'm watching him. No picture, nothing. He just goes, ch -ch 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 -ch. 12 year old boy, okay? So then we did all those incredible creatures, I think three of them, do more. So then we did the ones with Dan Breeding that have, I'm with a lot of the animals, like the boa constrictors wrapped around my neck and different things. And, and we had this uh, African crested porcupine this isn't symbiosis. I'm just, I'm just sharing a few things here, if I may, okay? And uh, this African crested porcupine, it's on the table, about a four foot table, and Dan says to me, I don't want it jumping off the table because they're hard to catch. Well, how do you catch a porcupine, <laughs> you know? And uh, so, okay, so he said, now, I'm down here, you're down here. If it turns and starts coming toward you, I want you to hold your hand out with some fruit, and it'll stop, and it'll eat the fruit, and won't jump off the table. Okay. So he's talking along, talking about it. You'll see it on one of those DVDs, whichever one. And um, all of a sudden, it turns around and starts walking toward me. It's got big quills. And I, so I held my hand out with some fruit. It looked at me, looked at the fruit, took a bite. Looked up at me, took another bite of fruit. Looked up at me and look back and wasn't watching what it's doing. And it came down on my finger, okay? Now, it just touched my, its teeth just touched my finger. And it opened its mouth and it looked up at me like, oh, oh no, what did I do? And it turned around, went back to Dan. And from then on, it wouldn't eat out of my hand. Was it embarrassed? Well, I mean, what, what's going on here with these animals? Okay, it knew it had done something it shouldn't do, okay? But then it would need out of my hand from then on. By the way, it did jump off the table. 
We had a hard time catching it. <laughs> we, I'm not even going to say we, Dan, had a hard time catching it. Uh, but he did. All right. Evolutionists teach life came from single-celled organisms of some kind that gradually, over millions of years, evolved into multiple-celled life forms, eventually becoming man. Okay, and I read you some quotes yesterday about where they say, you know what, there's only two options. We either evolved or we were created. I refuse to believe in the creation stuff because that's God. I'm not going to believe in God, so in spite of the evidence, I'm going to believe in evolution. That, that's, we read your quotes yesterday. If this was true, how did early life forms get their food? How did the first life thing get it? Where did it eat? Okay. Uh, how did flowers get pollinated if they were here before insects or vice versa? Where did the insects come from? By the way, some of you young people, if, if you aren't terrified with insects, they scare me. We need some good work done on insects. I mean, if they're like outer space, okay? I mean, you look at some of those under a microscope. Whoa! Have you ever looked at a mosquito's foot under a microscope? I got a picture in here somewhere of a mosquito's foot magnified like 32,000 times. You wouldn't have any idea what even that was. All kinds of little things going around in here and here and here. Just a mosquito's foot. And God thought all that up, and the mosquito needs that, so it can land on you, and you don't feel it land, and then it can numb you up just a little bit. Or it has its jabber, the thing that stabs you so he can get some blood, is sharper and smoother than any razor blade. All right? You magnify a razor blade. It has little bumps and things on it. That's about the sharpest thing we know of, okay? You magnify the stabber on a mosquito, there's not a single blemish. It is a totally smooth, razor edge sharp dagger. That's why it can bite you, and you don't know it's bit, bitten. It's bit. It's bitten you, okay? Until a little later when it starts to itch. Oh yeah, something got boom. Okay. Also, did you know leeches? They used to use leeches on people. <laughs> they thought it was helping. No, it wasn't. But anyway, leeches have two things that really help. Number one, they have an anesthetic agent kind of like Novocaine. And they have these little teeth, and they will numb up your area before they latch on. Some of them have like three jaws, and they'll latch on. And then they have an anticoagulant. They have a blood thinner, okay? So that once they start sucking your blood, it doesn't get clotted up right away and they choke on lunch, okay? How would that evolve? A leech? has exactly the right anesthetic agent to numb your skin so it can bite you and you don't feel it, and then it has this anticoagulant so your blood doesn't get a clot and choke, it, it leech is going to choke. <laughs> and God thought that up before he ever made anything. Now, now, he wasn't watching something, oh, I think I need to improve this. Or imp no, 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 he made it right the first time. That's our God. All right, evidence before our eyes. Symbiotic relationships. I believe they provide dramatic evidence against evolution. Many creatures, organisms, have such highly specified needs outside of themselves, such as the need to be in the right place at the right time in order to work with and sustain other individual life forms. Only a creator God, and the Bible tells us that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Where does it tell us that? Jesus is a creator. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. I tell you, you are the most alert, upscale audience I have ever had. We're on a day after, okay? And you're still remembering. I mean, amen. You've, you're encouraging me greatly, greatly, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Um, a mindless, random chance process called evolution cannot plan ahead for what a life form needs. Yeah, it doesn't know what's in the future. 
It just knows what's right now. Okay, how's it going to get things worked out here so something can survive if things change? All right, Isaiah 42. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out. I think part of that helps with the speed of light problem. He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Amen. God says, I won't share my glory. Isaiah 48, 11, and here. Evolution robs God of his glory. It steals his praise. What's the whole purpose? I can be here without God. Okay? So God says, no, 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 no. Don't believe that. That steals my glory. I won't give my glory to anyone else. Okay, symbiosis in the coral reef. Many corals have algae dependent upon them for life. The algae lives inside the coral. However, if evolution is true, what did the algae live on before the coral got there? Because that's where the algae lives. They have a mutual dependence upon each other. Okay, that's another problem then. Unhindered algae can suffocate the whole coral reef if there's something to not keep it under control, okay? Because it'll start uh, reproducing, reproducing, and all of a sudden, it kills the whole coral reef. But we have coral reefs, and the algae doesn't kill them, why? If the algae and the coral reef are not created at the same time, the algae would not have anywhere to live, but then would the coral survive without the nutrients from the algae? The algae does photosynthesis, different things, and provides food for the coral. And so, it's an incredibly intricate relationship, says this uh, particular article, uh, in which the corals feed the algae and they try to control their diet. The algae, in turn, use sunlight to produce junk food, carbohydrates and fats, for the corals. So they both feed each other. They're, they're mutually dependent on each other. And by the way, coral doesn't have any color. Have you ever noticed that? When you go to a seashell shop and you buy coral, it's going to be white. Unless it's in a place where there's some kind of something in the water, like there is some coral that's blue because of the contaminants in the water that gets in it, okay? But almost all coral is white. It doesn't have color. Well, then where does all the beautiful color come from in the coral that we see? It comes from the algae living inside the coral. The algae provides the beauty and the color to the coral. And certain types of algae like certain uh, species of coral. And so the coral many times becomes known by the color, by the uh, all kinds of beautiful color. Well, that's the algae. But the algae finds the right Coral. How? What? Okay. Uh, fascinating. Anyway, uh, it's an amazingly designed relationship that random chance could never explain. Inside each of the coral polyps lives this one-celled algae. Each of these little organisms gives off the oxygen and nutrients that the coral needs to survive. And as a return favor, the coral polyp gives off the carbon dioxide Remember, it's a plant algae, it's, 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 it works like that. The algae needs to allow for the photosynthesis to take place. Uh, the photosynthesis then produces sugars and amino acids, and if the coral didn't live in a sun-filled, shallow water area, the algae could not survive because there'd be no sunshine. So it has to be at the right depth in the ocean to get the sunlight down there. If evolution is true, how did all this just happen at the right time? Dead things don't evolve into more complex life forms. National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Ad Ad NOAA. The coral provides the algae with the protected environment and the compounds necessary for photosynthesis, which are me metabolic waste products of the coral. So the coral's given off its waste and the algae eats it, okay? By the way, have you ever thought about that? I think we have another one back there on God's environmental cleanup systems. Every single organic living thing, when it dies, there's a whole team of things 
that will take it all the way back down to original chemicals so that the plants can pick it up and start it all over again. Every single thing. That's why we don't go out and we find leaves stacked up to the moon, right? Every fall, you're thinking, hey, just rake in our yard. How many leaves? And you think of the whole forest and all these leaves are going to, they're all going to fall here pretty soon. Uh, something eats them up, okay? And then animals, animals die. We should have, if there wasn't anything to do the decay process, and we would be stacked up to the moon in dead bodies. But God made something to start eating every single thing after it dies. And then when it eats and dies, something's there to eat it, all the way down. That's a miracle, absolute miracle. You see, we ought to, there ought to be something that there isn't, it's, oh, it got out around it, you see, there's nothing there to eat that. Well, if there wasn't, we'd be stacked up to who knows where uh, with whatever that was, because nothing destroyed it. That's amazing when you think all these things our Lord did. Um, let's jump on down here a little bit. Uh, now see, look at this coral. It's beautiful. Not the coral. It's the algae. Makes it look that way. Okay? Uh, algae coral. They have such close relationship with each other that if the algae start undergoing too much photosynthesis and are not reduced, uh, and by the way, the coral tries to control that. So if the coral begins to think, oh, we're getting a little too much algae here, I'm going to shut off some stuff so they don't grow so much because I don't want to get smothered, okay? The coral, it tries to control all of that. But sometimes it gets out of control. What happens? Well, then God made another little thing. And see, it can bleach it all out if it gets out of control, the algae. So uh, he made a little fish called the parrotfish. And the parrotfish likes to eat algae in the coral reef. And so it keeps the coral reef clean from too much algae so it doesn't smother the coral reef. And by the way, in Bermuda, there's a pink beach. Anybody been there, seen it? The pink beach in, yeah, in uh, Bermuda. We've never seen that. I'd like to sometime. Uh, how did it get pink? Pink sand, yeah, these parrotfish, there's a particular species of coral with the algae is pink. And so these parrotfish, they'll eat it, they'll crunch off, they've got a real strong jaw and teeth, they'll crunch off some of the coral, the hard coral, and uh, when they digest it, then they excrete sand. Matter of fact, parrotfish produce much of the sand on the beaches all over the world, all right? That's their excrement. Okay, and so they, they got, they ate it, they, they gave off pink poop, excuse me, and, uh, and now you have a pink beach, all right, that's parrotfish. Uh, so they've been trying to keep the coral ridge from getting suffocated. Unchecked algae growth is not only detrimental for corals and seagrasses, it can spell doom for many other ocean species as well. Decomposition of algae consumes much of the dissolved oxygen in the water column that marine plants and animals need to survive. Although some coral and grasses are consumed in their quest for algae, without the constant grazing of the parent fish, algae populations would explode, choking entire ecosystems as they rapidly reproduce. So the coral needs the algae, the algae needs the coral, the coral needs the parent fish, okay, and they all need each other or they're all dead. How would that evolve? How would that evolve, okay? God's plan is always perfect. The teeth of the parrotfish, I love teeth, I'm a dentist. They can cause damage to the corals. Yeah, they can. I wonder if you get a gluttonous parrotfish and it just starts gobbling away and it's eating too much. I don't know. Uh, they become the major producers of sand in the coral reefs. This is the fish. The fish produce the sand. The Creator God equipped these amazing fish not only with teeth in the front of their mouths, that's what they bite it off with, but they have these flat-topped grinding teeth in the back of their mouth where they can grind it all up. Fish don't have that kind of thing. 
Okay. Well, these fish do. Well, how do the evolutionists explain that? I mean, if we all came from that first little single-celled whatever, one set of genes, how did that all happen? Look at this, okay? By the way, I don't know if anybody said it so far. I haven't heard it. Um, information is non-material, okay? You can't grab a piece of information out of the air and stick it into a gene. You can't take a gene and pull information out. So you can't add or subtract information from a gene. So how did the information get there? All information in every single genome had to have been supernaturally put there by God himself at the origin of that genome, okay? So what does that mean? That means God is in control of genetics, but now man is beginning to manipulate what God has done because he made us with intelligence. Uh, you know what else man is doing right now? He is manipulating the genetic structure of the race of Adam. That's us. And they, man is now creating a different race of people using Adam's genes and synthetic genes and animal genes, and they're mixing them up. And it's reproducible. This is the first generation where that's going on. Okay? What does that mean? Well, maybe that's why it says there in Mark, we're to share the gospel with every creature. I've often thought about that. Why didn't he say every person? Creature. I'm like, oh, there's a creature. Hello there, little cockroach. I'm going to share it. Maybe that's in there because in the last days, we're not going to know. Is that a human or is that some creature? We're not going to know. So we're going to share the gospel with every creature. They might look like a human, but they might not be a human. It's getting confusing. That's a different subject. You be praying. I'll cover what I'm supposed to cover this morning. Sorry about that, Stephen. Okay. These grinding teeth, the ones in the back, of the parrotfish are crucial for the parrotfish's nutrition because they break apart the walls of the algae and they release the nutrients for digestion. So it's, it's, it's got to eat all that stuff. So if evolution is true, how did these fish realize that they could eat the hard coral and not die? How did they figure out they needed a second set of teeth in the back of their throat in order to do it? Even the waste of the parrotfish is extremely useful to the ocean. Yeah, we need sand. It partially comprises the beaches of many tropical islands helping to begin the propagation of new plants and other life forms. Yeah, it all works together. On the ocean floor, this is excreted sand also lays a foundation for new coral formations. Okay, the parrotfish releases their eggs into the water column. They need that, they need the coral for their eggs because the eggs, it just shoots them into the water. And then uh, that's gonna flow through the coral and they're gonna stick to the coral and that's where the baby parrotfish, be. they're born there, they start growing there, and that's how all that works. Okay, so um, Psalm 145, look what it says. I will extol thee, O my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Think about it, just studying these things here. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation, okay, young people, that's your generation, shall praise thy works to another. You've got to pass it on, you see? You've got to pass it on. You're going to praise the works of God to the next generation and declare his mighty acts. That's what he wants us doing. So that's why I said, learn some of these things and tell the younger generation about it. And you big brothers and big sisters, you tell the little ones about it. You talk to them about it, okay? And declare, shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and thy wondrous works. Ay, 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 that's our Lord. Well, 
Um, since time is flying, well, the bioluminescence, the angler fish, way down there deep in the ocean where it's dark, okay? So they have a fish pole. That's why it's called the angler fish. They have a fish pole out here. And on the tip of the fish pole, they have a light, okay, because it's dark, it's deep down. And that light, they can turn it on and off, but they don't make the light. Bioluminescent bacteria in their fish pole make the light. Somehow, the fish communicates with the bacteria, turn on the light, I'm hungry. And then here comes something along, oh, ah, what's that? They see the light under this dark sea, and they go over and they're gonna get lunch, and then the angler fish, whoop, whoop, he's got lunch. But he can turn it on and off somehow. I haven't read any literature that says how that works. Okay, by the way, it is a heatless light. We still haven't figured that one out yet. Heatless light. If one of you young people can figure out how bioluminescence works in God's creation, and you can figure out how it works and turn it into light bulbs or something, you can give God glory and you'll be a billionaire, okay? Because it's heatless light. There's other things that do it. Lightning bugs. Same process, okay? All right, so, uh, well, I'm just, uh, m most of this you can get off our web page or off the table or David has a lot of it posted on his uh, web page and all kinds of stuff. Jesus Christ is the creator God. What's it say in Ephesians 3, 9? And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath seen hidden in God who created all things by Christ Jesus. There's another one. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, Ephesians 3, 9. Okay? In the King James. Now, I am going to jump over and close my part with the crimson worm. So we'll see if this works. Sometimes it just doesn't. But by God's grace, today it's going to work. So we'll go here and we'll go here and we'll try a function F8. Maybe we'll be here at noon trying to get it to work. Well, Lord, we need this to work. Look at that. Our God is faithful, okay? Because sometimes with my computer, when I switch like that, it doesn't work. All right, here we go. Crimson worm. Um, several years ago, I was asked to do a devotional at a church on crucifixion day, or, or uh, what we call Good Friday, okay? And... Uh, so I decided I'm going to do something on Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is known as the crucifixion psalm. That's the one where Jesus uh, says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He says it out loud, okay? So Psalm 22 is things that Jesus is either, he's either thinking, talking to the Heavenly Father about, or saying out loud, that's Psalm 22, while he is being crucified. All right? And so I get down to verse 6 of Psalm 22, and it says this. This is Jesus speaking while he's on the cross. But I am a worm. I thought, what? Jesus calls himself a worm? What is this all about? So I looked up the word worm. It's not the normal Hebrew word for worm, okay? The normal word is rima, But this word is tola or tolaoth. That's a different word. And that word is the word for a particular worm that's called the crimson worm or the scarlet worm. So Jesus equates himself at his crucifixion with this particular worm. So he had to create this particular worm before he ever got anything going. He knew he was going to make it. And it's the picture of him on the cross. Okay? So... Jesus equates himself at his crucifixion with the crimson or the scarlet worm, tola, tola off. All right, it's a little worm. Some, some places it's translated as maggot, okay? But it has a scientific name, Coccus illicis or Kermes illicis. Scientific world knows about this little worm. Why that particular worm did Jesus identify himself with at his crucifixion? Well, there's the distribution. It's all over 
uh, the Middle East in particular, down there in Israel, yeah, they used it for things. I'll show you a couple here. The mama worm. When the mama worm is ready to lay her eggs, she climbs up a tree or a fence post, and she'd prefer a tree, and then she attaches herself to the tree. Jesus was attached to the tree. Jesus said, I am that worm. And she builds this red shell around herself, and inside the shell she lays her eggs, and then the eggs hatch. They all hatch on the same day. And after hatching, the baby worms feed on the body of the mother for three days. What did Jesus say? This is my body. Take, eat. Okay? While they're doing that, the mother oozes a bright red crimson fluid. Jesus shed his red blood for you and for me. He says, I am that worm. The red fluid stains the tree and the young worms are covered and permanently stained with it. When we know Jesus as our Savior, we are permanently covered in his blood. After three days, the young worms are ready to leave the shell. The mother is still attached to the shell and to the tree, and she dies attached to the tree so that she can birth her family. Jesus died attached to the tree so that he could birth his family, the church. On day four, the mother worm's tail pulls up toward her head into like a heart shape, but it's no longer red. In a matter of minutes, it turns into a snow-white, waxy material, and it begins to flake off like snow and drop to the ground. It looks like a piece of wool stuck on the tree. What's that say in Isaiah 118? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, tola, that's the word right there. Though they be red like the crimson worm, they shall be as wool. What's God saying? It doesn't matter how black your sin is. God says, I want to wash you white as snow. That's what happens when we trust in Jesus. We are washed as white as snow. Okay, while the worms remain and the shell are still red and attached to the tree, this is before they turn white, they're scraped off and used to this day to make royal red dye in the Middle East. The white waxy material is used to make a high quality shellac, which is used as a wood preservative in the Middle East. Jesus is our preservative. The worm's remains also are used to make a medicine aiding in the regulation of the human heartbeat. Jesus is the life. And by the way, four billion people heard that just a couple weeks ago at the Queen's funeral service. They read at least twice, we heard it, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The whole world, BBC, four billion people heard it. They heard the gospel. Four billion all over the world just two weeks ago, whenever that was. All right, now, the red dye of the crimson worm was used to dye the robe of the high priest red. And Jesus is our high priest. And most probably, it was the, dyed the covering. The ram skin covering was dyed red that covered the tabernacle. We're covered in the blood of Jesus. Jesus says, I am that worm. So... Uh, then we get to the last verse of Isaiah. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. People that die, they never trusted in Jesus as their Savior, as their Messiah. They die. What's it say? For their worm, and there it is again, the toloth, the crimson worm, shall not die. What if Jesus didn't die? You can't be saved. What if you don't believe he died for you? You can't be saved. Okay? Neither shall the fire be quenched. They'll be abhorring to all flesh. Well, Jesus quotes that one right there in Mark, Mark chapter 9. Uh, let's jump down, 47. If thine eye offend thee, plug it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hell fire where the worm dieth not. Right there it is, New Testament. Jesus, if you don't believe he died for you, the worm won't die. What if it didn't die? Well, if it didn't die... It couldn't give birth to its family. What if you don't believe Jesus died for you? 
well then you're going to keep living according to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and the tormenting worm will never die. The lake of fire is your final destination. That's all there is to it. It's real. It's, it's true. That's what's going to happen. You've got to have trust in Jesus as your Savior. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You'll have a new birth, a birth that's now possible because Jesus sacrificed his life willingly attached to Calvary's tree. Jesus died so you can live. The mother Toloth dies so that her babies can live. Jesus equated himself with the Toloth, the crimson worm, at his crucifixion. So the mother worm willingly climbs onto a tree to die to birth her family. Jesus willingly went to the cross to die so that we can live eternally with him as his family. The baby worms are covered with the red fluid of the dying mother just as we're covered with the red blood of Jesus and are washed as white as snow. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, Hebrews 9.22. Ephesians 1, 6 and 7, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We're accepted. How? In whom we have redemption. How? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So Romans 10.9 says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart. It's not just intellectual belief. Does the devil believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, he's met him personally. Is he going to heaven? No because he's never received the forgiveness. The death shall be saved for a woman. So let's go here. Look at this. One verse in Job, Job 25, 6. How much less man, talking about regular man, that is a worm, remark, normal word for worm. And the son of man, which is a worm, tola, or tolaoth is the book of Job prophesying when the Son of Man comes. What's Jesus called in the Gospel, especially Matthew? The Son of Man. When the Son of Man comes, he will be like the Tola Oth worm. He'll be attached to a tree. He will shed his red blood. He will die attached to the tree so that he can birth his family. I think it is. I think Job is prophesying. And so one more, which I don't have right here. In Jonah, you remember Jonah? Ah, I got to quit in half a second. Jonah, he's supposed to go and evangelize Nineveh, but he doesn't love anybody but himself. He's looking out for number one, just like the present generation, the selfie look, looking out for number one. They'd rather take a picture of themselves than somebody else. Click, uh, that wasn't good enough. Try this one. And uh, Jonah. So God raises up a vine, a gourd vine, and he's in the shade, and they're dying, or they're, they're getting saved. And God says, hey, Jonah, you don't even love the cattle, let alone the people. I'm going to destroy that plant. So what, he sends a worm to kill the plant. What worm? The Tola worm. Jesus is not only our Savior, he is our judge. And he judged Jonah and destroyed the vine so that Jonah would be trusting God instead of self and learn how to love God with his whole heart and mind and soul and strength and love the people like he loves himself. And you think of the primates, what is that? The apes, the monkeys, and the prosimians, and uh, baboons. Do baboons have a tail? Okay, if baboons have a tail, that means they're in the monkey family, all right? Apes, no tail. Prosimians, yeah, they have big bushy tails. Baboon, it has pouches like a hamster, okay? It'll eat what it wants, fill up the pouches, then go where it feels safe to eat. By the way, when they, uh, let's say, here comes a pride of lions, and you have a baboon, a troop of baboons, they travel in big groups, like 30, 40, 50, 60, okay? So here come some lions, and one of the baboons gives the signal. Oh, the lions are coming. They don't run. The baboons get in a line in front of the lions. Here comes the lions, and the baboons all start turning flips in front of the lions. And the lions must decide, there's got to be an easier way to get lunch, and they just go away. Well, how would the baboons know if we turn flips, the lions will go away? See, God had to put that information in them. Okay, so they have pouches, and this particular baboon is called, um, 
I don't know why you call it Calvin, but that's what he gave it. Uh, and uh, the baboon, uh, now watch its eyes. Uh, it's, it's challenging me. Well, I guess we just went past that. It turns its eyelids white. And it would look around Dan and turn its eyelids white. And Dan said, whatever you do, don't look at the baboon. He considers that a challenge. And he'll attack you. And I can't do a thing about it. He's seven times stronger than I am. Their muscles are different. We're supposed to come from things like that. Their muscles are in a mesh instead of like long striated muscles, cells, okay? Which means when they squeeze the mesh, it makes them much stronger than we are. And um, so anyway, it tried to challenge me. And he said, don't, don't look, don't look. And uh, uh, so I didn't look, I'm still here. Uh, but it didn't like Genity. And so in the cage afterwards, I mean, that baboon just charged the side of the cage when it saw Genity. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was her hair. I don't know. Uh, all right, let's get, see if we can get to the next one. All right, the I.I. It's another primate. And this one has a middle finger. looks like a piece of wire coming out of its hand. There's no other primates like that. Where's that come from if evolution is true? So we got one with pouches. We got one with this middle finger. Then we had the slow loris we already talked about, venom gland, the only venomous primate. Okay, now the eye eye, I think it keeps disappearing. There it is. Okay, here we go. Uh, some of the most beautiful animals on planet Earth. And uh, they're a sea snail, but they don't have a shell. So they're going to attract everything in the ocean. Beautiful colors. Hmm? What? Yeah, I'm on the eye eye. Well, it's showing. All right, here we go. The eye eye. I don't know what happened to my new bronc. Look at those eyes. It hunts at night, and it'll take that long. It'll chew into the tree. It does what, be what uh, woodpeckers do. There's no woodpeckers in Madagascar. So it, chews, it, it does what woodpeckers do. It chews into the tree and uh, finds the grub tunnels, then sticks that long middle finger with the hook on the end down in there, stabs the grub, uh, brings it out, and has lunch, okay? Big ears, because it can hear the grubs crawling around down in there. And uh, so, let me uh, stop that one. Well, what if I pitch this? Yeah, okay, here's a nudibranch. By the way, that's not a nudibranch, that's a snorkeler. Here we are. Um, some of the most beautiful animals on planet Earth. Thank you, Genity, for reminding me where I was. <laughs> And uh, look at those things. Beautiful. Now, they steal their defense mechanism. They don't have a shell, so they don't have a defense mechanism. Well, they steal one. So they'll eat anemones and, and jellyfish and things that have those stinging cells. They're called nematocysts. And those nematocysts, they, ha they're like, they have like a trigger. If you touch them, they explode right into you. That's why you just touch a, a uh, one of those tentacles, let's say, on a jellyfish, bang, 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 bang. It shoots you. Well, it eats those things, but it doesn't set off the little explosion. There's a PhD in marine biology for someone. What's going on here? Okay, so it eats them, it digests it, but it doesn't set off the little explosive cells, and then it takes those cells, potentiates it, makes them a stronger pop. How's it do that? And it puts those cells in tubes the creator made beforehand. It puts them in tubes in its body and then pushes it up and into its skin and out its gills. And the defense mechanism of what it ate becomes its defense mechanism. It steals its defense mechanism. That's why most of you never heard of the nudibranch. Okay. What, what do we have on it? Oh, yeah. We, we've got the gibbon. And the gibbons, uh, they're the ones that have that. 360 degree or 370 degree shoulder joint. So watch, watch Dan now. Watch, watch. Here we go. And watch the bottom. All right. Now. No, don't go home and try that. It'll tear your shoulder to shreds. Okay. So they have a, a whole set of mechanisms in their shoulder to keep the nerves working, to keep the blood flow working. Okay. If you got twisted up like that, the blood would be shut off. It'd be terrible. So God made that specially so it can get away from the pythons up there in the trees. And it works very well. Now, if I hit this, let's see. Oh, oh no. Um, 
Okay, I'll show you the hissing cockroaches. Now, Dan was having a good time with me this particular day when we're filming, and so he started putting these cockroaches on me, okay? And I had the heebie-jeebies. It's like I'm thinking, ay, 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 because they're crawling, and one of them went up my sleeve. Ah, ah. Well, I mean, it was like a $35,000 day of filming, okay? There's all these cameras and all this stuff around. So I got to act like I'm happy or something. Just, look at this. They're big. You know, they're like, like that. Uh, and so here they look on my shoulder, and I'm thinking, ay, 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 I didn't like that. And Dan's just having a good time. Anyway. These uh, hissing cockroaches, they're a delicacy in Madagascar. People eat them. They have contests. Who can eat the most? Why? Well, because they have a chemical compound that's like uh, Novocaine at the dentist. It's like lidocaine. I'm not going to look at them. <laughs> and so as you chew them, they give off this anesthetic and it puts your mouth to sleep so you eat one and your tongue is going to sleep you eat two your cheeks your tongue is going to sleep you eat three your throat everything's going to sleep most people stop at three where did that come from how did that evolve okay well not only that the female uh, hissing cockroach they hiss they got these spiracles spiracles and little holes and they suck air and blow air and so they have different sounds the male has at least three different hisses. The male has one hiss that says, I'm a big, strong male. Don't get in my territory. Then he's got another hiss that's, oh, I'm a big, strong male. Would you like to go out and get pizza? And so, and then he has another one. It's kind of like, hey, everybody, let's just get together and have fun or something. Okay, three different hisses. The female cockroach hissing has one hiss. As far as I know, it is the only living creature that has less to say than the female. So, that's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> I'll keep moving. What? The only female, oh yeah, that's right, that has less to say than the male. I must have said it wrong. I must, <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that's a joke. By the way, I wouldn't have much to say at all if it wasn't for my wife. I guarantee it. Okay. And if I didn't say what she told me to say, I still wouldn't have much to say. So, all right. I wanted to show you a few animals, and we've been talking about God's creatures. I want to finish my part talking about God, our Lord, our Creator. And I want to do that in Isaiah chapter 40. So if you have your Bible, we're going to do a 10-minute quick look at Isaiah chapter 40. Now, the context is the Jewish people, they've lost their love of God. They are loving the world. They are loving idols. They are loving the things that God says, don't love those things, love me. So they're coming under God's judgment because of that, and they have forgotten who their God is. They've lost their perspective, okay? Now, we can do that as a Christian. We can lose our perspective. Let's not forget who our God is. Okay, so Isaiah 40. By the way, Isaiah is known as the Bible in miniature. Okay? Uh, first 39 chapters. Basically, Old Testament law and the judgment that comes when you don't do what God says. That's the first 39. How many books in the Old Testament? 39. So you got 39 chapters, basically Old Testament thinking. Then you have chapter 40 to 66, 27 chapters. How many books in the New Testament? 27. And that gets more into the New Testament ideas. And it actually starts with John the Baptist. Where's the New Testament start? John the Baptist, okay? It goes all the way through the gospel, Isaiah 53, especially the best gospel in the whole Old Testament. Then it ends up with the new heavens and new earth, where the Bible ends up. And the last verse is an allusion to the lake of fire, okay? And so here we go. Isaiah 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to the Jerusalem, and cry unto her. Her warfare is accomplished. Her iniquity is pardoned. She hath received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. God is our comfort. 2 Corinthians 1. And then we're to comfort others with the comfort he gives us. Okay. So God, and by the way, God says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Are you praying for the peace of Jerusalem? 
When there's peace in Jerusalem, what's that mean? That means the prince of peace, the creator, is ruling from Jerusalem because there'll be no peace in Jerusalem until Jesus comes to rule, okay? So we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, that means the rapture's over, the tribulation's over, the kingdom is here, okay, when the, there's peace. He goes on, verse 3. Now this is John the Baptist, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. What's it say? In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. So Jesus is saying, Isaiah talked about this situation. And this is John the Baptist. He's talking about back there in Isaiah. He just says it right here. This is from Isaiah. And what did Isaiah say? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, and he goes on. So that's what we read. So it starts right here with John the Baptist. Every valley shall be exalted, verse 4 in uh, Isaiah 40. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And so what do we have here? Well, when the monarch, when the king came to town back in those days, the people in the villages would go out. They would level out the road. They would smooth out the road, dirt road, get the boulders out, get the gully. They wanted the king to feel good when he came to town and not be bounced around in his chariot hitting boulders and stuff. And they wanted a smooth ride so he'd be happy when he came to their village. Well, what's God say here? When the king of kings comes, he's going to rearrange the surface of the earth. It is going to be a big deal. Okay, so he says, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, verse 5, Isaiah 40, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand forever. God's word is eternal. God is eternal. Tells us that over here in, what is it, verse 28? Yeah. God is eternal. His word is eternal. People are eternal. He wants us to invest our life in eternal things. Okay. Now, what do you say about the grass? He didn't say it dies. He says it withers. God doesn't talk about plants dying, okay? So on college campuses, students will come up. Well, you say death began with Adam. Well, what if Adam ate a plant, like a, maybe he ate a carrot before the fall, before the curse, okay? Before death, as you say. Well, then that plant died. He ate it, okay? No, God never says plants die, okay? Uh, he says they wither. They fade away. All the way through the Bible. That's the way it talks. James tells us the same thing. So there's three kinds of life, if you want to call it life. Maybe plant life is not really life in the sense. But anyway, plants have a flesh. They've got a body. Animals have a body and a soul. So they have two things. Okay, they have a soul, a nephesh, just like we do. Genesis tells us that. Genesis chapter 2. They... The animals have a nephesh, a soul. What's your soul? Mind, will, and emotions. Do animals have a mind, will, and emotions? I don't know if a cat does, but I know a dog does. <laughs> they have a mind. I know cats have a mind. Anyway, dogs, do they have emotions? Yeah, they have emotions. Uh, do they have a will? Yeah, don't you touch my bone. Uh, so, yeah, they have all that. And, but we have a mind, a soul, and a spirit. Because we're created above the animal kingdom to take dominion over the animal kingdom. Okay, so if somebody says to you, well, there's death before the, you, Adam because look at it. No, no, he never tells us plants die. All right, so then he says, uh, uh, God's going to remind him who he is here in just a minute. Verse 9, O Zion, that bring us good tidings. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Get thee up on a high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Tennessee, Behold your God. Yeah, be fearless. We're to be fearless in our testimony for our living Lord. Verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand. His arm shall rule. 
for him. Behold, this is second coming talk. His reward is with him. His work before him. When Jesus comes, he is coming as the king of kings. He's coming in strength. But look at verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. He shall gently lead those that are with young. When he comes, he's coming as a mighty king. But he's also coming as the gentle shepherd. He's, he'll hold us in his arms. Okay, that's our Lord. He's both, okay? And now he's going to start reminding the Jewish people, you have lost your perspective. You've forgotten who your God is. So I'm going to review it for you. Okay, so here he goes. Uh, verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? God knows how much water. Do you? No, you don't know that. And meted out the heavens with a span. He knows where the picket fence is around the the universe okay now, I don't think it's a picket fence I think it's actually a water canopy around the universe I think Psalm 148 alludes to that so he knows how far space goes it's not infinite only God is infinite and he has comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure do you know how much dust is sitting on your nose right now God says I know how much dust is in the universe he's weighed the mountains in the scales he knows how much the mountains weigh yeah, there's a mountain right out back do you know how much it weighs no and the hills in a balance. This, this has the idea of God is keeping earth in balance. Uh, the word there would be isostasy. All right? He's keeping it in balance. Uh, why? So it doesn't just wobble uncontrollably. All right? And throw you off. Okay? So God keeps it in a balance. Well, and he says, who had, now he's, that God is greater than everything in his creation. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? By the way, God is superior. He's greater than every man. Who has told God anything? Can you teach God anything? Well, we try, don't we? God, your timing is off. You better get this done. Okay, yeah, we try to tell him. Okay. No, we can't. We can't. Verse 14. With whom took he counsel? Who instructed him? And who taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? No. See, he is superior to every single person, and we can't teach him, tell him anything because he knows everything. He knows your situation right now. He knows it all. He knows, he knows what you're thinking right now. All right, so that's he's better than any man. Now, he's also greater than any nation. He says, Behold, nations or as a drop from a bucket. You ever heard that saying? It's like a drop from a bucket. Uh, you know, you, when I used to work on my cousin's farm, you had to feed the hogs, and, and at one point we'd feed them hog, what they called hog slop. It was a big bucket, and you'd carry the bucket of hog slop down, you'd dump it into the feeding trough, and here comes the pigs. By the way, pigs are the smartest domestic animal. And you dump it in there, and then you look in the bucket, oh no, there's a drop of pig slop in there. And you'd tip the back of the bucket, you'd get in there, and you'd get that one last drop, and you'd push it all. No, you don't even think about it. That's what God is saying, you see? He is, he is greater than any nation. Nation, whole nations are like a drop from a bucket. They're counted as small dust of the balance. They're counted like a speck of dust on a scale. So some of you ladies are a little older. You probably remember you go down to the grocery store and you're going to buy uh, two pounds of tomatoes. And they had this wooden, uh, this metal pan with chains coming up hooked onto this big scale. Okay. Does anybody remember that? Okay. And so you would get your tomatoes, put them in there. But before you did, you would take that scale, the metal part, and you'd go, <laughs> and you'd blow all the dust off, right? No, it never entered your mind. You wouldn't even think of it. It's too insignificant, okay? No, yeah, and then you'd weigh your tomato. No, what is God saying? Whole nations are counted as a speck of dust on a scale, a, a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. He can lift islands right up out of the sea. Now, he talks about Lebanon. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient as a burnt offering. Take the whole country of Lebanon, Lebanon, make it a burnt offering. No, no. Look what he says next. All nations. So take all the nations on earth, all their nuclear weapons, whatever they have. All nations before him are as nothing. 
they're counted to him as less than nothing. How much is that? I mean, less than nothing? <laughs> Can you tell me how much that is? I mean, what is less than nothing? It's nothing, nothing. <laughs> you can't get any nothinger than that. Uh, and vanity. So God says, I'm greater than any nation. I'm greater than any person. Uh, to whom then will you liken God? This is artist terms. Uh, or what likeness will you compare to him? In other words, get out your painting, paint a picture of me. God says, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. Uh, then he talks about the images and the, and the idols that they've been making, and they're ridiculous. They're just ridiculous. That's what he's saying. Uh, it's he, verse 22, that sits upon the circle of the earth or the sphere of the earth uh, or the vault of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens as a curtain. There it is again, stretches them out and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings priest, princes to nothing, judges there is vanity, Yea, they shall not be planted, they shall not be sown, their stock shall not take root in the earth. See, he's greater than these people, these judges, they think they're so powerful. Like we have judges right now in our Supreme Court. They don't go by the Constitution. No, they just do what they want to do according to their political leanings, okay? It's not supposed to be that way. God says, you know what, they don't mean anything to me, I'm bigger than any of them. By the way, praise God, we at least got something going here for pro-life. And whirlwind will take them away like stubble. He'll just blow them away. To whom then will you liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes. Now, he's reminding them, don't forget who I am. Look what he says. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? It's referring to stars. Who has created the stars? That bringeth out their host by number. How many stars are there? Well, don't tell me, because nobody knows. They think there could be a trillion, trillion. God numbers them. He calls them all by name. What? A trillion, trillion names? In our best English dictionaries, including technical languages. Now, they might have to add a few now. We have woke language. But in any event, about a million, four hundred thousand words. If all of us thought, sat here the rest of our lives and thought up nonsense syllables, we couldn't come up with a tenth of a percent of a trillion, trillion words. Gip, goop, doo, boom, bump, write it down. Nope, couldn't even get there. Now, he, he knows all this by the greatness of his might. He is strong in power. Not one faileth, not a single star fails. Whoa, what's a supernova? See, we need some of these astronomy people to tell us what is a supernova. There's something left because God named it. By the way, there's people out there saying, send them some money and they'll name a star after you. God already named the stars, okay? So, I'm finishing right here. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord? Oh, God doesn't know what's going on with me. He doesn't know what's going on with me. My judgment is passed over from my God. Oh, God's not concerned about me. Uh, God doesn't love me. No way. No way. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He faints not. Neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. He did that for my wife and I this weekend. We were out. We were out. We shouldn't even be here. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall. God says, it is my strength. So what are you supposed to do? Verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord, don't get ahead of him. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That's the Hebrew word for exchange. We're going to exchange our strength for God's strength. This is not me. This is Jesus. Okay? And what happens then? They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. What's God say? I want you to exchange your life for my life. I want you to have Jesus in your heart. And then you don't do things for me. You do things from me. It's Jesus coming through me. That's what's important. And when we live that way, nothing is impossible for God.